spirit and the word for your mind, your body, and your soul. It's right there in the word. The word of God will set you free. It's right there in the word. Eternalizing is the key. It's right there in the word. Good afternoon and welcome to another installment of There's a Word for That. The weekly word presentation is part of the Hymns by Phil Carter Fellowship. Today's word is hope. It's taken from Psalm, 122, from Psalm 22, verses 1 and 2. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. I would dare say that this is one of the most bone-chilling and earth-shattering scriptures in all the Bible. It was raised first by David at a desperate time in life, but then it is repeated again in the Gospels of Matthew and Mark. And every time I read it, it's left me feeling some kind of way, that feeling of forsakenness that leaves us crying out to an absent God. When I was growing up on Good Friday, some preachers of old would call this the dereliction of God. The dereliction of God? When they recited these words of despair uttered by Jesus on the cross during that gruesome scene, they would explain God's absence this way. They'd say on that Good Friday, things got so bad at the cross that when Jesus took on the sins of the world, took on your sins and my sins, it was so awful a scene that the sun refused to shine and God in all of God's holiness could no longer stand to be in the presence of a sinful Jesus. So while the sin debt was being paid, while the transaction was going down, God hid God's face and turned God's back on Jesus, if only for a moment, in order to satisfy the debt. Mm. That may sound reasonable to some, but it raises a protest in me because it is inconsistent with what the whole of the Bible teaches about God. Because if that were in any way the case, if there's any amount of sin or sorrow that could make God cut and run while Jesus is hanging on the cross, then God is not who God says God is. And if God is not who God says God is, then we don't stand much of a chance today. And I know, I understand the doctrine of atonement. I understand the contradictory dilemma of trying to companion holiness and evil, that they can't partner in the same place or be companion together. But wrestle with me for a moment as we present what we already know and then use that to make some sense out of what makes no sense. It makes no sense to believe that God turns God's back on Jesus or on us because God is a God of omnipotence. God has all power in God's hands and God ain't scared of nothing. God ain't never hid from nobody and an omnipotent God has no need to hide from sin. This behavior is not consistent with the God we know, nor is it consistent with the scriptures. I wonder who it is that came up with this synthetic, manufactured, imposter God who is afraid of the dark and who won't come out at the noonday night. The Bible says God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And God did not hide when God allowed sin in the world. And God is not hiding or turning away from it today. God might hide us, but God is not hiding from sin or from us. So that makes no sense. But it also makes no sense to believe that God turns God's back on Jesus because God is a God of infinitude. How can a God who is everywhere at all the time, all the time, meet who meets God's self coming and going, who was and is and is to be, who is Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, whose reign runs from everlasting to everlasting? How can this God cut bait and run from Jesus and sin? David said, where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to the heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, you are there. If I take to the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, your right hand holds me fast. Where are you going to go? 
that God is not already there. So it makes no sense for any of that, but it also makes no sense to believe that God turns God's back on Jesus because God is a God of the Trinity. Ours is a Trinitarian faith. Were God to turn God's back on Jesus, that would mean a breaking apart or the separation or the rupturing of the Holy Trinity. It would give us a picture of a schizophrenic, ambivalent, shaky God and not the God who was and is and is to be. The Trinity is three in one. It must work together or not work at all. So what does make sense is this. Jesus did not die on the cross to save us from God. Jesus died to save us for God. We never needed to be saved from God. Our greatest need is to be saved from death, saved from hell, saved from sin, saved from the devil, saved from the grave, even saved from our own selves, but never from God. And it's on this cross that Jesus does this in communion with his Father and not apart from him. But let's face it, I want to be honest this morning, this afternoon, all of us feel dark feelings, the dark feelings of forsakenness and despair at some time. We feel that way and we can all share the midnights of our souls and the walks through the valleys of the shadow of death. I know we love to liberally quote Jeremiah 29, 11, declaring that God's got plans for your life, plans to prosper you and not to harm you and to give you a future with hope. And I believe that is true for us, for the people of God, for the community of God. But can I be honest with you this morning and tell you that there are some in-between moments, in-between the promise and the manifestation, in-between what God said will be and what has yet to come, where you will come face to face with feelings of forsakenness. Like when God finally gifts you with the pregnancy that you long prayed for and then the baby dies in the ninth month. That's a feeling of forsakenness. Like when you reach retirement and the spouse you plan to live happily ever after with suddenly develops dementia and no longer even knows your name. That's a feeling of forsakenness. Like when the deal goes bad and your prom- uh, and your promotion and a big raise turn instead into a forced resignation and an unemployment check. It's a feeling of forsakenness. Like when the child you dreamed would one day matriculate into Morehouse, but instead ends up getting lost locked up in the big house, like when the second and third opinion doctors say there's still nothing more that they can do. Feeling forsaken at times is a part of life. It's the part we don't like to confess or to talk about, but we should not have to hide those feelings because they are a part of life. We shouldn't have to pretend like everything is Facebook happy, pretend that um, that, that things are Instagram wonderful, <laughs> because therein lies the tension in the text. Either Jesus, either God is all powerful and can reach through the suffering that we feel sometimes, reach through the forsakenness that we feel and cover us and show up, or God is not any of that. Either God has power over sin, death, hell, and the grave, or God does not. Because when Jesus cried out in a loud voice concerning his feelings of forsakenness, he's letting us know that he feels sometimes what we sometimes feel. In fact, actually, what we have here on the cross is Jesus reciting David's despair in Psalm 22 and the fulfillment of the prophecy. And I don't believe it's because he's convinced God has left the scene. I don't believe that at all. I believe it's to let those of us know on this side of history that even though those dark moments of abandonment and suffering and despair will come in our lives, there is still some hope on the other side that if you hold on a little while longer, longer, things will get better. If you can believe that joy does come in the morning, things will get better. There is a reason to hope the sun will shine again. Brighter days are up ahead. You see, if you keep reading the psalm, you can't stop in verses 1 and 2. You've got to read all the way down until 22, and you start getting some glimmers of hope and getting and get to 24, where it says, For God has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. God has not hidden God's face from me, David declares, but has listened to my cry and for help and, and helped when I cried to him. That's, that's the message that we want to know, that we want 
want to be assured of that gives us hope that even when we are crying out and we can't see or feel God or can't trace God anywhere, God is still there. God hears and God listens. So that's it. That's my time for today. But just let me leave you with this for God has not forsaken you. Keep hope in God when life doesn't make sense, when midday turns to darkness, when the Messiah God who promised to be with you uh, has seemingly fled the scene. Hang in there a little while longer. And you don't really have to believe just believe it just because I say it. Look back at Jesus on the cross. Jesus in the midst of his despair says, my God, my God, I feel so all alone. Why have you forsaken me? But, 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 but the victory is just around the corner because he shifts from my God, my God to father into thy hands. Those companioning hands, those creating hands, those comforting hands, those hands that feel like home to me. Father, it's into thy hands, into your hands. I commend my spirit. Somebody in here, somebody who's listening today knows that when you feel betrayed by God, when it looks like the bottom has dropped out, when it feels like all hell has broken loose and you feel like the Lord has left you and you're groping for some semblance of God's presence, don't give up on God, but do what David did and do what Jesus did. Find strength in what you once knew and know that God is still with you. Hold on a little while longer. Be still and know that God is God. Keep the faith. Know that the Lord your God neither slumbers nor sleeps. God never takes a vacation, a sick day, a hiatus, or a spring break. God is not AWOL in your situation. For God can't forsake you any more than God could turn God's back on God's own self. And there's too much of God in you for God to to forsake you. Too much of the love of the Father. Too much grace in God's hands. Too much mercy pulsating through God's being. Too much forgiveness and too much holiness for God to turn God's back on you. Well, I could go on and on, but I'm really out of time this morning. I just need you to know that, that God knows all about our situation. God hears us when we cry. There is always a reason for hope, knowing that the best is yet to be. The latter is greater than the rest. And God's got good plans for our lives. This is Pastor Cynthia Turner Wood. I'll see you next week for another installment of There's a Word for That. Thank you so much for listening. God bless you.